Okay, again, it's a new request for tonight's Dhamma talk. Uh, it's a request from someone I went to visit last week who just had an operation and was asking me to talk about how to deal with pain. So, tonight's talk is the Buddhist attitude and responses and ways of dealing with physical pain. Because this is part of the uh, reason why people come uh, to places like this, coming to solve the problems of life. And one of the major problems which we all have to face from time to time is dealing with pain, physical pain. And of course, the first uh, piece of advice I give, if you have physical pain, the first Buddhist strategy is to go and take a paracetamol. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> If you have one, because Buddhism is very, very practical. But sometimes they don't have those things. You know, sometimes, you know, like you know why there is actually there's no um, aspirin in the forest. Why you never find aspirin in the jungles in the forests? Because paracetamol, paracetamol. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> And that's the first experience of pain you're going to have this evening. <laughs> Parrots, etymol, paracetamol. Say it quickly, okay. I'll carry on. <laughs> but there is sometimes when no matter what uh, drugs you take, sometimes that pain is always going to be there. We always have to experience pain from time to time. And one of the great things about a religion like Buddhism, because it's a religion based on meditation, based on understanding the psychology of the mind, understanding how we work, there's lots of wonderful strategies for actually dealing with the pain which we have to feel in daily life. And sometimes the great pains we experience from time to time in hospitals when we're having operations, procedures, which despite all the palliative care that sometimes we have to face, and so because each one of you, if you haven't faced it already, one day you're going to face that pain, it's a good thing to learn right now how to deal with the pains of life. Now, the Buddha was obviously uh, understood a lot, a great deal, huge amount, about how this body and mind works. One of the things which he used to teach is that when we talk about pain, there's two parts to pain. He called it like the two darts. There's a physical dart and there is the mental dart. The pain in the body and the pain in the mind. And he said that you can separate those two. When you have a body, you can have to experience a physical pain from time to time. But at least you can take out the mental dart, the mental part of the pain. And this is a fascinating and very powerful technique for dealing with the pain which we experience from time to time. There is the physical part, but there's also the mental part, and if you know the difference between the two, then there's something wonderful you can be able to do. You can take away the mental part of the pain. And if you start to do this, the physical part is very, very different. Many of you have heard me tell this story before about the time I had this terrible tooth take in Thailand. For the first couple of years, there wasn't even, and I know there was, it was in a forest, and so there wasn't any aspirin because of paracetamol, but there was, wasn't even any paracetamol either. There was nothing in the medicine cabinet. And there was no dentist, no doctors for miles, and so you were stuck with this terrible toothache at night, a long way from anywhere, and you had to some, somehow try and deal with that pain. I have got a strong mind, but... That pain, sometimes you come across these pains which are much stronger than you. There's no way that I could even meditate. I couldn't watch my breath. Every time I tried to watch my breath, I could maybe watch it for one or two breaths, and then the pain would kick in the doors of my mind. This is what it was like. You could not stop it coming in. It's as if my whole side of my jaw was exploding in pain. It was the worst toothache I've ever had in my whole life. There's no way you could sleep or meditate. So I didn't know what to do. 
Late at night, it always happens in the late at night when his pains get very bad, I decided to try some walking meditation because I couldn't sit still. Walking meditation, many of you may have seen if you've gone on a retreat, you walk backwards and forwards, mindful of the legs moving, left foot, right foot, in a pheasant moment, silent. But I had to stop the walking meditation because, <laughs> you heard the story before, I was running meditation. I couldn't do anything slowly, which is one of the symptoms when you have pain, you're desperate, you have to do things fast. So I stopped the running meditation, I went back into my hut. It was very late at night, didn't know what to do next. And I decided, uh, this is only my first year I was a monk, I decided to try and do some Buddhist chanting. You know this great Buddhist chanting which we can do, some of the sutras of the Buddha, which is supposed to have magical properties, which is supposed to be able to make you wealthy, get rid of diseases, give you long life. Actually, I was telling someone about our cat in the monastery. Our cat, Kit Kat, is 17 years old. This is cat years. I think in, in human years, that's about 120. That's a very, very old cat. And people want to know, how come that cat has lived for so long? Because every day of its life, it's listened to Buddhist monks chanting. So, of course, it lives a long time. <laughs> so, you can expect cats and other animals in monasteries to live a long time, and there's the proof. But anyway, back to what I was saying before about toothaches. I didn't. I was not very convinced at that time that this chanting business worked because I was a scientist before. That was just mumbo jumbo, magic, and sort of only sort of uh, people with low intellects would believe in that chanting business. So, <laughs> I did the chanting. Anything, anything. <laughs> anything just to get rid of this pain and I had to stop the chanting after five minutes you know why because I was shouting at the top of my voice when you have great pain you are desperate and you can't do anything slowly you have to actually shout it and I was afraid not that I'd just wake up the monks in the monastery but I'd wake up the village two kilometers away I was shouting so loud now this was the first one of the first times it's a wonderful experience when your back is against the wall, as they say. My teacher, Ajahn Chah, said it very beautifully. He said, you can't go forward, you can't go backwards, and you can't stand still. Sometimes we're in those situations. You can't stand for, you go forward, you can't go backwards, but you can't stand still either. You're completely shot, you're desperate, you can't stand another moment of the pain, but then you can't get rid of it. And because... I'd come to talks like this before because I'd listened to some teachings. I remembered two little words, powerful words. You've all heard them yourself. Very short words, let go. Now, you, how many times have you heard those words? Those of you who come here, how many times have you actually done that? Really let go. I remember those words. I had no choice. I had to, yeah. otherwise it was just too painful. So it was one of the first times in my monastic life when I let go, really let go. And what happened next really surprised me. And it showed me what pain truly is and what the mental part and the physical part is. Because as soon as I let go, I'd actually taken out the mental part of the pain. I let it be. I didn't fight it anymore. I allowed it just to exist. And as soon as I let it be, the strange thing happened, the pain disappeared. And it vanished in a second and was replaced by this wonderful feeling of bliss. And of course, it's a strange, strange experience, but it's a true one. And not knowing what to do next, I decided just to cross my legs and meditate. And I had a wonderful meditation for an hour or two, just you know, meditating in peace, no pain at all. And then it was late at the night, he had to get up at three o'clock in the morning. So I decided to lay down, have a sleep for about an hour or more. You know, for the bell at three o'clock. I woke up before the bell. There was a slight ache in my mouth, but hardly anything at all. Later on, he managed to actually to go to a dentist and get the cavity filled. But the point was, there was immense pain. And just through doing a little two words, let go, the pain vanished. It really showed me just how much of pain is the mental part and the physical part is only a small part of the pain. Now, it gives you the indication of the Buddhist attitudes to pain. If we really try to let go, if we do it properly, there's no problem anymore. 
The problem is the fighting. The problem is pain. Get out of here. You don't belong. I don't want you. And this is one of the reasons why, when I've mentioned this before, people have tried that. They've had pain. They tried the letting go. And they come to complain afterwards. They say, Ajahn Brahm, it didn't work. And I asked them, what they would, I knew what they were doing. They had the pain. And they said, come on, let go. Let go. Let go. You haven't gone yet. Now, of course, that's not letting go. That's trying to push it away. You're doing letting go to try and get rid of the pain. And that's not letting go. That's doing a business deal. The letting go has to be pure letting go. As if you're saying to that pain, you can be with me for the rest of your life. You don't have to go anywhere. I can be with you, pain. I can be your friend, no longer your enemy. That takes a lot of guts to do. It takes a lot of courage. But if you can do that, you'll find the pain completely transforms. The part of the pain which is the problem is get out of here. You don't belong. I don't want you. I want to be somewhere where you're not. I'm trying to get rid of you. I don't like you. Get out. You see the mental struggle against the pain? The struggle to try and get rid of it? In Buddhism we call that craving ill will. We want it to be different. Rather than actually facing it, being with it, even being compassionate, having gentleness towards the pains in our body, rather than having this fear, this controlling. That takes a lot of guts, it also takes a lot of training. You find actually that when you practice these sorts of skills you learn in your meditation, you find it's easier to do. You're easier to bear with things, rather than always fighting them. It's a part of our training as monks in Thailand that our teacher, Ajahn Chao, was very tough on us. There was a word in Thai which he would use very, very often. There are some Thai speakers here. It was called Toraman. It's the same word they use for torture. <laughs> he said he would torture us. You know, we should have really complained to Amnesty International and got that monk arrested. But it was all out of compassion. For example, to teach us about not complaining about temperatures. I see a lot of people here, you've got blankets on, so you're cold. Sometimes, you know, when it's too hot, you put the air con on, you wimps. <laughs> now, this is actually how my teacher taught us. We'd have one meal a day in this monastery, usually about 9 o'clock. We finished about 10, 10.30. In the hot season in Thailand, I mean, it gets up to about 40 degrees. But this is in the humid heat. Not like the dry heat here. And then he would, after the meal, everyone would have to go into what was used to call the old sala. This very, very small building where we'd all be sitting, maybe 30 monks, 40 monks, all close together. He'd close the doors, close the windows, had a low metal sheet roof. You had to sit there. You, we have these robes, this robe over here. We have a spare robe. You had to put the spare robe on as well. You could take blankets if you wanted. And you sat there for two hours in the hot heat. <laughs> you call that torture. Well, it wasn't really torturing the body. It was teaching the mind. Because the only way you could deal with that if you stop complaining. Now, when you start to complain... That is where the pain starts to come. It shouldn't be this way. Why is he doing this? We should actually complain to the... We have like a, a war uh, crimes tribunal. There should be a monk crimes tribunal as well. <laughs> or something. We should complain. He's got no right to do this. As soon as you started complaining, that's when it started to hurt. As soon as you let go, then it was very, very peaceful. It was always that negative part of the mind. And that was the whole purpose why my teacher was trying to do this. To point out that you're going to have to be here. You've got two ways of dealing with this. You can complain. And you can actually hurt yourself. You can get pain, pain, pain. Or you can let go and learn to be at peace. 
and realize this discomfort of the body is just that. It's just a feeling which comes and goes, which is not really important. It's not life-threatening. In fact, sometimes people actually pay money for that. It's called soreness. We got it for free. <laughs> so, he said, this is where you learn. It's a mental part. It's the one where you can really work. And that mental part of that pain, when we start complaining, the pain gets worse. Even when I was, you know, when I was at uh, college, we did a little bit of rowing. I remember once the coach sort of screaming out to me because it was a long row and I was getting very tired and he said, you're making a face. He said, smile, and then the oars will become easier to pull. And it obviously worked. When you stop complaining and even with your face and you relax your facial muscles, it became easier. And that was reinforced once when I was the first year in Thailand, where I learned much of these uh, teachings just by the encouragement of your teachers and just by the experiences of daily life. We used to go from monastery to monastery for ceremonies or for this or that, and we'd always go as young monks in the back of a pickup truck, in the back of a ute. But those youths, where we used to sit, the senior monks, they'd sit in the front cab. They were okay, but us poor monks in the back, we had to sit in the back. And on the back of those utes, the, the uh, pickup trucks, there always was a metal frame over which was stretched a canvas. It was supposed to protect you from the rain and from the dust. The trouble is that, probably to save costs, that frame was very low maybe because the ties at that time were very short. But of course, as a Westerner, I was quite big, in comparison. And those roads were all dirt roads with many potholes. So when that truck went over one of the potholes, the truck went down and I went up. <laughs> many, many times you crack your head on those metal rails. It's all right for you because each one of you has got padding. We didn't have any head padding, bald heads. And so you crack and you crack your head very hard on these metal railings as you went over these potholes. Being a Westerner, part of my culture was if you hit your head, what do you do? I swear. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was doing. But every now and again, you went uh, on a big pothole, and even the ties, they would also hit their head and go crack. They didn't swear. They just laughed. I couldn't figure it out. How can you laugh when you hit your head that bad? I started thinking about it, and I came to the conclusion at first that maybe those time monks had hit their head so many times, they were, you know, something's wrong with their brain. <laughs> That's why they were laughing. They were stupid, brain damaged. <laughs> but I realized that some of these were young monks. They couldn't have had that many hits on their head to be brain damaged. So I decided, <laughs> because I was a scientist before, because Buddhism is all about reason, like cause and effect, trial and sort of investigation. So I decided to do it in an experiment. I resolved in the back of that in that car. The next time I hit my head, instead of swearing, I'm going to laugh like the time monks laugh. That's what I decided to do. So I did it. The next time you went over a pothole, you hit your head, and I stopped myself swearing, and I laughed instead. You know what I discovered? I discovered an amazing truth. If you hit your head and you laugh, it hurts much less. <laughs> it's true. If you don't believe me, ask a person sitting next to you to hit you over the head. <laughs> I guarantee you it will hurt less. <laughs> now, can you understand about what I'm saying about the mental part of the pain and the physical part? If we swear at pain, it's this fault fighting. I don't want this to happen. Why me? This shouldn't happen then you actually really add a lot of the hurt to your pain. If you can let it go, to laugh at it, be at peace with it, accept it as part of life, you'll find it hurts much, much less. So a lot of times if you are hurting in pain, 
Sometimes just even a little smile is enough actually to lessen the pain. Even doctors know what is it when you smile, when you laugh, endorphins uh, release into your blood system. These are nature's painkillers. They help your immune system. Actually, you don't get infected. You don't hurt so much. Very simple teaching. Even the doctors know the mental part is paramount, is important. So here we start to train ourselves. And one of the reasons why our teacher Ajahn Chah had us sitting so long without being able to move, why he would actually put us in that sort of hot room for two hours in the hot season after the lunch. Why we do that? To teach us to let go of the mental part, the physical part you couldn't do much about, but at least you could stop complaining. A lot of the times that where we do experience like the physical pain, what is actually happening or why does it come sometimes so great that sometimes we can't stand it? I've often looked at that and I've asked myself, what do you mean you can't stand it? You are standing it. The pain is here. What's the problem? And you've found out that a lot of the problem with pain, why people can't take it any longer, is because they project into the future. It's the important thing. I can't take that pain any longer, any more. It is the fear of the future pain makes it unbearable. And actually, this is the other strategy, which as Buddhists, especially meditators, who can learn how to let go of the future and stay in the present moment, they can let go of the fear which is associated with the pain. And it's the fear which is the other part. It's part of the mental part. It's the fear which is one of the, almost like the killers, what makes pain unbearable when we think we can't stand it any longer. We're just going off into the future and thinking this pain, if it carries on like this, I can't stand it. Point is, with the future, one thing we always know is the future will always change. It never stays the same. That's why when my teacher Ajahn Chah would go and visit his disciples in hospital, when they were very, very sick, like I was sick after one year, scrub typhus, in his hospital, very sick, feeling terrible, in pain. He would come in and just say, that pain will not last. He would say, you'll either get better or you'll die, but it won't last. <laughs> so if you're in great pain in a hospital, if you go visit some of your loved ones in hospital, and they're very, very sick, you can always tell them that <laughs> I'd probably kick you out. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? Can you bla can you find fault with that? No matter how painful it is, it's either gonna get better or you're gonna die. Oh, <laughs> so you can see it's fear of what might happen next. Now that is the problem. Why is it that with pain we get all this fear involved? As for example, I remember just being in the hospital once in here in Australia. And you know what happens in, well, maybe it uh, doesn't happen to you, but it happened to me. I was in this room with uh, three other men in this hospital. It was a great fun being a monk in hospital. Because number one, as soon as I was admitted, they asked, where's your pyjamas? And I said, monks don't have pyjamas. And they said, oh, really? What are we going to do? And I say, I can wear these robes or nothing. Take your choice. So I said, we'll ha have you in the robes. So, so I wore my robes in the hospital. And when I started to get better, I remember going to the toilet, walking to the toilet, and I walked past the women's ward. And one of the women said, she got really scared. She thought it was some of her friends coming to spook her. I said, it's very fortunate that she wasn't in there for a heart complaint, otherwise I might have killed her. <laughs> but, but anyway, sort of, uh, what was it? Oh, yeah, in this, this hospital ward with three other men, you know, just uh, spending all day together, started talking about this, talking about that. And the conversation we got into, it's really stupid. We started getting, what's the worst you know, medical procedure you've ever had? And somebody said, oh, you know, we had this injection. Someone had said that. And one of the people sort of said, oh, I've been in hospital so many times. You know, you have all these people who've been in there much longer than you've ever had. And they said, oh, the worst is a barium enema. That's really terrible, they said. And this poor fellow in the corner bed, he went white. 
He said, that's what I'm having this afternoon. <laughs> What a silly way of spending a morning sort of talking about these terrible things. <laughs> but that would have been painful for him once we sort of psyched him up that way. It's going to hurt, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt. Then of course it does hurt. How much of pain is anticipation? Fear. It's going to hurt, I know it's going to hurt, I know it's going to hurt, and then it does hurt. That's why, that monastery in Thailand, the first year, if you'd have visited, you'd have been very surprised when you went into our library. We only had a few books in the library. And one of the books we had in our library was a book about how women can give birth to babies. <laughs> and what's that, what's that doing? So in a, in, a, in a Buddhist monastery in the northeast Thailand full of men. And the reason it was there, because I had a very interesting chapter about this community in somewhere in, I think, Tennessee, I think it was. It was like a hippie community, but they'd, you know, they were, had their act together. And one of the things they learned how to do was learn how, to, in their community, to actually encourage ladies to give birth in a very unique way. They started changing the vocabulary. When a woman got pregnant, they would say, you're not going to have labor pains, you're going to have labor energies. <laughs> now it's taking away it's taking the word pain away and call it energy it's, it's amazing what happens because they had nine months to convince or brainwash these girls it wasn't labour pains it was labour energies and also that during the um, time of labour the birth they had all of the uh, midwives around and whenever there was like one of these big contractions for the body they were cheering like on a, on a, a footy pitch and always giving the same advice, go with it, flow with it. Now let go, be one with it, go with it. And all these ladies, they wrote these um, stories about their births, amazing birth stories, I think it was called. And it was incredible just how many of these ladies, one had very, very short um, periods of labor, incredibly short, and how they, it was not painful at all. They'd psych themselves up to call it labor energies, these huge forces going through their body. They were being supported all the time instead of people saying, oh, you poor thing, do you want an injection? Is that hurting? Is that hurting? And because of that support of like letting go, flowing with, change of vocabulary, then they never experienced any pain. That's what they wrote. It was just labor energies flowing through their body. And they never resisted at all. They went with every one fascinating how the mental part of the pain was taken out and they had the physical part which was just feeling forces energies just passing through their bodies now half of you at least are not going to have babies <laughs> many of you are too old already we always get old people come into religious places so <laughs> but it's true nevertheless you're going to have all sorts of pains happening to you sometime in your life. Now, the pains of old age, the pains of sickness, the pains of all sorts of things. And this is, gives you some understanding of what you can do. Now, with this body, with this physical pain, instead of fighting it and saying, get out of here, you don't belong, those pains which you can't beat, and there are many of those, we learn to live with, we accept, with compassion, with kindness, with gentleness, with peace, with letting go. All these beautiful words which are all pointing to the same thing, which is being at peace with things. The mental part of the pain we take away, and instead we give peace, acceptance, stillness, and you will find that if you really do it 100%, the mental part of the pain disappears. And all you've got left is the physical part. It's part of having a body. And it becomes easy to endure. Because the endurance part is the mental part. One thing which one can always do is that wonderful little uh, word. Now you just let go. But to understand like the beautiful truths of impermanence and each other, this too will pass. It's a great little 
a word which you can always say to yourself whenever you are in great pain. This too will pass, this too will pass. The original story of that, which you can apply to many things, but here I'm applying it to pain, was of this emperor who became an emperor when he was very young, as a boy. And as an inexperienced young man, whenever the country was going well, when there was prosperity, when there was uh, people were happy with the, the government, the emperor would always have celebrations and parties. And... Because of that, he didn't do enough work to keep the prosperity going as long as it should. He was partying too much. And when things started to go badly, when there was an economic recession, when there was enemies at the gates, when the people were striking and not happy with the government, then he got so depressed. He spent most of the time in his room sulking rather than doing any work. Because of that, the bad times lasted longer than they should. So the ministers who got together in private, they couldn't actually tell the emperor what to do because that was the emperor's job. They were only ministers, but they thought of a scheme to try and help their young emperor. And all they did was to actually to get a jeweler to make a ring for their emperor, a very simple gold ring, the only unique feature was the words which were inscribed on the outside of the ring. And those words were, This too will pass. And they told the emperor to wear that on all occasions. So during prosperity, the emperor would wear that ring and would look upon it. This too will pass. Prosperity, happiness, health, it doesn't last. We all know that, but because we forget it, we take it for granted. Because we take it for granted, we're heedless. We don't work hard, even in the prosperous times. In the good times, the happy times, the times you have your loved ones, they're there. We take it for granted. We think, well, they're always going to be there. Our health... We think our health is our birthright. We're always going to be healthy. Our prosperity, our peace, we think it's always going to be that way. We take too much for granted. When we look upon that ring, this too will pass. It means we're always heedful, making the best use of the moment, looking after this because we know it won't last, therefore we work to keep it going as long as it possibly can. And because of that, the good times, once the king or the emperor kept looking at that ring, the good times lasted longer than usual. And when the bad times came, he also looked at that ring. This too will pass. So he never got so depressed. No matter what was occurring in his kingdom, no matter how dire the situations, he knew one thing, the situations would always change. This too will pass. So that gave him hope. And that meant that even during the rough times, he would still be able to work instead of sulking. And the bad times never lasted all that long. He became a very successful emperor and also a very successful person. In pain, that's one thing you can always remember. This too will pass. The pain doesn't last all that long. The worst part of the pain is the fear it's going to last forever and it's going to get worse. This too will pass. You should be able to stop that fear. Instead of allowing our mind to project into the future with the fault-finding mind. The fault-finding mind always says it's going to get worse. It's going to get terrible. I know it's going to get bad. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be horrible. That fault-finding mind is part of most Western people's nature. Whenever we look at the past or look at the future, we always take up the bad stuff. Just even in my monastery a couple of days ago, a couple of the novices had a little argument, yeah. and one of the novices was very upset and came up to me and said, oh, just, you know, this person, he said this, he shouldn't have done that. And then I said, what else have they done? What else have they done even this last week? 
And he couldn't think of all the good things that person has done. They could only think of the bad things. And I repeated what I said here a couple of weeks ago to each one of you. When we have that fault-finding mind, we pick up all of the rotten things which someone did, did, and we don't pick up the good things they've done. That is the same as a person who keeps chickens, and whatever the chickens have laid overnight, they go in the morning, they only pick up the chicken shit, and they don't pick up any of the eggs. Remember that one? Picking up the chicken shit and not picking up any of the eggs is looking back what's happened over the last week and your friend only remembering all the rotten things they've done. Just don't think of any of the good things they've done. Now, fear is actually that into the future. Reflecting, you pick up all the rotten things which might happen in the future instead of the good things. That's called fear. You've got this negative, oh, it's going to be terrible, something terrible is going to happen. And it's that fear of the future which means that pain becomes almost intolerable. You are experiencing, you are handling it right now. It's the fear of the future. That is the problem. Now that fear of the future is just an undisciplined mind. A mind which hasn't been trained. A mind which goes off and thinks the worst which can possibly happen, which is what fear is. We look into the future. We think, oh, something terrible is going to happen. Oh, I'm not going to be able to last. Oh, I can't stand this any longer. What would happen if... We don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's why all projection into the future is just an undisciplined mind. And if we have pain projecting into the future with a negative mind, it's just going to make the, the, the pain absolutely intolerable. So, if we do have pain, we tend to stay in the present moment. It's hard to stay in the present moment because what happens with pain, it tries to push us away somewhere else. Pain, the way we look at it with the mental, I'm going to try and get rid of this. I'm going to go somewhere where that pain isn't. The Buddhist way is actually going towards the pain rather than going in the opposite direction going into the pain rather than trying to flee away someplace where that pain isn't. Because if we try and flee away, we usually flee away into the future or flee away somewhere else and we get just more fear. When we go into the center of the pain, the center of the moment, it's like, and you'll experience this if you do this, go into it rather than go away from it. It takes a lot of courage at first because it goes in the opposite direction we're used to. When we go into it, it's like coming to the center of the cyclone. You come to a space where the pain is like around us, but we don't feel it in the very middle. I remember a teacher, Ajahn Chah, telling me this. He had suffered from malaria for about three or four years. In those days, most monks who meditate in the jungles would get malaria. And he said that no matter what medicine, nothing really worked. Whenever he's got a bit weak, the malaria will come and ravage his body. And he said one day he had a bout of malaria. And he decided instead of actually to try to run away from it, it was he ran towards it. He said he went right into the center of that fever. And he's, this is what he described it like. Like he was being in this middle of this fire. But he was in the center where it was very cool because he wasn't running away anymore. He was right in the middle of it. He said as he sat there in his mind, in the middle of this great fever, the fire got hotter and hotter and hotter, until it got so hot that it just exploded. And then he was at peace, and he never got malaria again. Amazing. This is uh, what Ajahn Chah said, how he overcame his malaria, going right into the center of it, into the middle. Now, maybe that's how we can get overcome pain as well. Go right into the center, right into the middle of it. Because it's in the middle is where the mental part can't find us. Because there we're actually letting it be. We're going into it rather than allowing it to actually to push us away. That's where we find freedom from pain. 
freedom from pain, pushing and pulling us around, making us go here, making us go there. Here our mind is free. The body can be at pain, but the mind isn't. That was one of the beautiful teachings of the Buddha. When one of his disciples, a very old man, came to see him, and the Buddha's advice was, even though your body is sick, your mind does not need to be sick. Even though the body is hurting, the mind doesn't need to hurt. He explained how that's done by letting go of the mental part of the pain, accepting, learning to be with, tolerance, being with. If you can do that to your physical pain, learn how to be with these things. Stop trying to get rid of them. Stop trying to change them. Stop trying to make them different. Then maybe you can be able to learn to live with your husband. (laughs) Or your wife. Or that person in work you don't like. How often is it that we react to the things we don't like in life in the same way as we react to pain? Get out of here. You shouldn't be like this. I shouldn't be hurting. And of course, we should realize by now, we've lived long enough that pain is part of life. There's nothing wrong with pain. How many people here have never had a moment of pain in their life? Of course, it's a silly question. We all experience pain. Pain is part of things. In fact, if you look very deeply, what pain truly is, is only the gap between two moments of happiness. When happiness disappears, then there's suffering. Suffering disappears, and then there's happiness. Pain and pleasure. That's all they are. That's why, as a human beings, we will have some pain, we will have some pleasure, usually in equal proportions. That's part of our birthright. We have to learn how to live with it. And in fact, the more we accept the pain, the less painful it really is. And this is actually how, as Buddhists, we can actually learn to be with pain. Which is why that, especially in places like hospices, the, the doctor, he thinks she was a Christian I met in Malaysia. She was actually telling me, and there's a very a wonderful little uh, accolade she gave. She said, in her hospice, it was the Buddhists who were the easiest to deal with, who died with greatest, I think she said, grace, simply because those Buddhist attitudes which people had learnt in the temples, which they had honed with their meditation, they could learn how to be at peace with the pain of their final days. They could learn how to let it be. When they cracked their head, they could laugh instead of swearing. They could learn how to accept rather than always fighting. They knew the difference between the mental part and the physical part. Look at even like in footy matches, people can break their legs and they don't even feel it. Why is that? Because the mental part is somewhere else, they're just enjoying the game. How much is it the mental part and the physical part? That's why we can actually develop the strong, positive mind to laugh at pain, to actually to be at peace with pain, to actually to let go of the fear of the future, and then you'll find it's easy to be with the aches and pains of life, especially those times when you have no opportunity, no choice. You have to deal with the pain because the medicine just doesn't work. That's where you go into the present moment so no fear can come. You can be with rather than trying to get rid of. You can say this too will pass, so you can bear it. It's not that bad. The mental part is what we overcome. And it's not just that. It means the other parts of life which we're negative towards. We use pain as almost like a training so we can be at peace no matter what happens. It means not just learning how to deal with physical pain, but learning how to deal with disappointments, learning how to deal with things happening in our life which we don't like the other sufferings of life which we can't do anything about. We know how to let them go, let them be, stop trying to get rid of them. 
knowing that this too will pass, we can endure, no matter what's happening to us in life. It'll always be changing. We can bear with it. We can laugh, no matter what happens. And that way, we know how to transcend not the physical pain of our bodies, but the pain of life, which happens from time to time. Isn't it the case when something tragic happens, fear again, how can I cope, how would I live, what will happen, what will I do? Look at us monks. We don't even have any money, we don't know who's going to feed us tomorrow. People always do, but they didn't in the early days. In the early days when there wasn't so many people looking after us. I was talking about this to the Thais last week. Sometimes in the first year we came here, there was a roster system. Just only two monks, myself and Ajahn Jakara. There was a roster system of people who would bring food. Sometimes the food was in the fridge. Sometimes you could look at it, you could smell it, but there's no one to give it to you. So it had to stay in the fridge. We had to fast. That's what it was like in those early days. But it didn't matter. Can you fast? Can you go without food? How many days can you fast? In the case, thinking about it, we think, oh, I can't do this. I remember just as even a student, I had a, a, a bet with, I had a Christian friend, and I was a Buddhist, and I wasn't going to be outdone by the Christian friend. And so we were fasting and see who could actually win the fast. And I used to, when I was fasting, only for three days, I used to deliberately cycle past the fish and chip shop to, to, to really test myself, you know, to smell it, to, you know, to actually see it, but not be able to eat it. It's just like, <laughs> it's a strength of mind, that's all. And that strength of mind is allowing yourself to be with these things instead of trying to get rid of them. Just knowing this two will pass, in two or three days you'll be able to eat. So what, big deal, you miss, a, miss one meal. You see, you get that toughness of the mind because you know that most of the problems with that, if it's fasting or with its physical pain, it's just the mental problems, that's all. It's just you're thinking in wrong ways. And it's that mental part of the pain which the Buddha said is the problem. That's what you can do a lot about. That's what we learn. We learn, as it says on that statue outside, to purify the mind, to train the mind, to make the mind a smart mind rather than a stupid mind. If you make the mind to be a smart mind rather than a stupid mind, then you have the ability to endure pain, fasting, whatever it is, with ease. You're not afraid anymore. You can allow it to be. You have all these wonderful strategies, no matter what happens to, it, to you in life. You can be able to bear with things. The physical part of life, sometimes it will be hot, sometimes it will be cold, sometimes it will be pleasurable, sometimes it will be painful. Physically, but the mind has let go, can bear with. The mental part of pain is taken away. And there you are at peace. Feelings, that's all it is. Feelings coming in, feelings going out. Even the pain of sound when people call you names. That's all it is. Sound coming in, sound going out. This too will pass. Big deal. Your mental part. They shouldn't have said this. They shouldn't have done that. The mental part is taken away. So to summarize the talk about how the Buddhists deal with pain. They deal with pain, first of all, if you've got a paracetamol, you take that first of all. <laughs> if not, there's nothing you can do. At least you can actually take away the mental part. I don't want, I don't like, get out of here, you don't belong. And if you can do that, you'll find that the pain is just feeling and it doesn't hurt anymore. And you can apply that to other things in life which hurt you. It doesn't hurt anymore. The mental part is taken away. That is what you can do. The physical part is up to the doctors. The mental part is up to you. So that's the talk this evening on how to deal with pain in your life. Any questions about this evening's talk? Go on in the back here. Yeah. 
but slowly bringing up. Well, you can get a pick this kick by the end of the bread or not. I'm bowling. <laughs> any tips where well, it's like most of these things it's better to learn it in plenty of time rather than the last minute and I think that when you get the old people's home you're very close to the last minute <laughs> so if you can learn these techniques you know before it's really what well, you think is really necessary a lot of times we always do things at the last minute. If we do it now, you know, where we've got a strong mind, we train our mind now, then I think when we really need it at the time of death, then it's very easy in our old age. Our problem is we think we're not going to get old. How many people here are old? <laughs> I used to run this youth group here. And, you know, I think it was the 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds many years ago. And so I asked them, sort of, you know, what is old? And they discussed the matter. And in the end, they came up to anyone over 35. <laughs> so that was a definition from my youth group. So that, <laughs> we never think we're old. And that's one of our problems. So we actually don't prepare for our old age, for our sickness, even for our death. And it's most important. I mean, you, you train when you're young to actually to work. You can even actually go to classes for, for learning how to be married. You know, like marriage preparation classes. Wouldn't it be a good idea to have, like, classes on how to be sick and classes on how to die, classes on how to get old, so prepare yourself before it happens? To train yourself but it's true that sometimes that if a person's got Alzheimer's they only remember what they learnt in the early years so if you know those in your early years then you don't have to worry about when you're old the attitudes are what counts <laughs> so maybe a bit old for, for <laughs> but anyway you can always sort of think you can always get the tape and I sort of keep playing it again and again and again because you've got these CDs that go round and round and round and round. And round. <laughs> Any other question on this evening's talk? How to deal with pain? Yeah. Only visual karma. Ah, the actual sum of the pain which you have to experience, the physical pain as part of your karma of the past. How you deal with it now is the karma of the present. So the uh, fatal, faith part is actually what you dealt with, the cards, the ingredients of your life. How you put those ingredients together, how you play that deck of cards, that is the karma of now. So even if you have got pain, yeah, maybe it's you know, because of the past. But the way you deal with that pain, you are free to deal with that pain in whichever way you wish. So, the calm of the past, yes, but how you're dealing with that is the calm of the present. That's why you're never completely confined by your past karma, because the way you deal with that is completely at your liberty. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Yeah? Okay, yeah, no, I think the story was that towards the end of his life he got a sickness, but he actually suppressed that sickness for three months for just a short while. And he just had a few more things to do. When those things were done, he can't, even the Buddha died through a sickness. But peaceful during that sickness. It's a wonderful thing to see, to see sick monks who are supposed to be in pain but are very peaceful. You know, it's, you know, you wonder what's going on. They should have a lot of pain, but they're not. Or even to see, not alone monks, some of the disciples from here, who should be in great pain. But you see them there, they're smiling. They're happy. Even though their body must be hurting. And those are people who have understood the message. It can be done. It is done. And it's the only way to go. 
Because sometimes that those the pain management, sometimes it just doesn't work. Or sometimes they, you can't get the drugs for them soon enough. Sometimes they have all these amazing stories of, what was that story about that person who was in a mining accident up in the north? He was the person, he was, uh, he would drill the holes, set the explosives, and blast the end of the mine shaft at night time, ready for the people to come during the day. And this was some time ago, and actually pick out the ore. And if you only do it at night time, he would do the night shift by himself because it was a dangerous task. However, he was very, very skilled, but he said that one morning he had a premonition something was going to happen. He checked all his equipment, he couldn't see anything wrong. He went to the end of the shaft, started drilling the holes, when he heard the sound of one of the ore trucks coming in his direction. The people on the previous shift hadn't put on the brake properly, and it was rolling towards him along this narrow shaft. There was no place to escape. It was coming directly for him. He said, just before it hit, he thought the only thing to do was to jump. He couldn't go to the left or the right, the shaft was too narrow. He jumped, it hit him. He cut off both his legs. And he was there with you know, two legs missing, sort of in pain, bleeding. He said it was the most peaceful experience of his life. It was no pain, he said. He became so peaceful and he had one of his religious experiences that when he actually, um, in the hospital afterwards, when the fellow who was responsible for leaving the break off came to see him and he called him friend he said look there's no problem at all I even thank you for that experience there are times sometimes when we have the great pains that's where we can truly let go if only we do that with the ordinary pains of life then we might actually learn a great lesson about the difference between the mind and the body mental pain and physical pain physical pain is very small so the fit, the, yeah, it's a mental pain, which is a big one. Which is also, you know, just why the, I said why people commit suicide. Not because of physical pain. Most people commit suicide because of mental pain. Maybe in physically good health, but they just split up with their boyfriend or girlfriend. Or some small thing, and that mental pain, that is the killer. And this is actually why the mental pain the Buddha said, that is the biggest pain of all. Physical pain is small. If you can get the mental pain right, then the physical pain is easy to bear. Okay, so I won't keep you in pain any longer. It's six minutes past nine. So now we have our president to give our announcements this evening.